So I have a confession to make. I am a marketer, I work in marketing, and I hate marketers. I do, I do. Um, and I know that sounds somewhat self-deprecating and a bit paradoxical, but it's true. And I don't hate marketers as individuals, as people. I hate them as an industry because of how we approach marketing. And you know, it's been said beautiful things about marketers, which really gets to my singular beef with them. See, it's been said that good marketers see consumers as real life human beings, having all the dimensions and trappings that real human beings have. And while that's a beautiful sentiment, my years of experience, my years of practice have taught me one thing, if anything, is that marketers don't know jack about people. Marketers suck at understanding people. You don't believe me? Case in point, exhibit A, demography. Demographics is the tool, the instrument that marketers use to describe people, you and me, based on race, gender, age, household income, geography. Like we, they use, we use, this instrument to describe people. And while these things are factual, they are true, they don't accurately describe who people are. Take for instance my demography. I am 37 years old, I am African American, if you hadn't noticed, <laughs> born and raised in Detroit, went to public schools my entire life, right? Now if a marketer saw that description of me, they'd probably say, oh, he must walk like this, talk like this, go to these places, do these sort of things because <laughs> now it sounds horrible, it hurts the ears to hear you say that, but that's how marketers think, right? And while yes, I am 37 years old, and yes, I am African American, and yes, I am from Detroit, and I went to public schools my entire life, these things don't give rise to the fact that I grew up playing jazz as a kid. <laughs> or I swam competitively from six years old to 18 years old, which is a huge stereotype break, trust me. <laughs> or I, or I, I studied engineering undergrad, but I love to sail. And these experiences shape how I see the world. They frame how I see the world. And based on how I see the world, it informs how I operate in the world. And demographics can never get close to that. Now, a savvy marketer would say, well, of course, duh. That's why you focus on psychographics. Psychographics do a far better job of describing people. They paint a more vivid picture, right? Instead of looking at gender and age and, and marital status, we look at your interests your likes, your passions, right? The vivid picture of who you are. And while psychographics indeed paint a far, far, far more vivid picture than demography does when it comes to people, demographics, I mean, psychographics only speak to what people do. What we do, not why we do. It never gets at causality. So it begs the question, is there a more accurate way to describe people while also paying mind to what they do, the causality that pushes and drives their behavior. And there is, fancy that. It's called our networks. Our networks. Our networks are a far more accurate way to describe people. And by networks, I mean this in the most radical, simplistic way possible. The people by whom you would share information, experiences, data, contacts, and the alike. Your people. Your friends, your networks of people. Your family, your networks of people. Your coworkers, your networks of people. Your classmates, your networks of people. Your congregates, fraternity brothers, sorority sisters, club mates, teammates, our people. Our people are a far more accurate descriptor of who we are and what we're likely to do. Psychographics, by nature, are a byproduct of the networks to which we subscribe. And the beautiful thing about networks is that they're all around us, all around us happening. In nature, we see it when we think about streams and lakes and rivers, they're all networked. We think about carbon chains that network together to create tangible things, like clickers, for instance. They're all networked. Biologically, our brains are wired by small road networks which maximize connectivity based on each dyadic tie. It's no wonder then why we build our power grids and networks. Or we build our roadways, our highways and railroads by networks. Our cell phone towers are all networked because people are naturally networked. As Aristotle would say, 
Man by nature is a social animal, and indeed we are. We do everything we can to connect with the people that matter so much to us, our network. Now, some years ago, a gentleman by the name of Seth Godin brought forward this notion, this idea of <coughs> tribes. And tribes speaks to our proclivity to connect with people who like some of the things that we do. We have similar interests, similar bond, right? And I love the notion of tribes because it kind of plays on the metaphor in anthropology about people coming together like clans. And it's a really powerful notion to think about people. But when we think about life, we think about people through the lens of networks, it takes a step forward from the fact that people have a proclivity to come together, to socialize, but then it also speaks to the dynamic that happens between said people. And when we think about our networks, we're constantly a part of networks. We got groups of friends, our friends from back home, our friends from school, our friends from church, our friends from the team, our people. And in each one of these networks are dynamics that guide the behavior of said networks. The shared beliefs, social norms, unwritten rules and rituals that guide the behavior of those people. Take for instance one of my networks. I'm in the Collins Network, my name is Marcus Collins, I'm in the Collins Network. And in the Collins Network are shared beliefs, social norms, and unwritten rules that guide our behavior. For instance, we believe family and church come first. Therefore, on Sunday mornings, I'm in the church sanctuary. Or Sunday afternoon, I get a call from my mother, very passive aggressively saying, how was your morning, Marcus? <laughs> That's just how she gets down. Right? Our networks, and it guides my behavior. See, Sam Summers puts it this way. Much of our daily lives are governed by social norms. There are societal expectations of what is acceptable behavior among a group of people. And we adhere to those behaviors, those dynamics, to stay in good standings with our people. Right? Because ultimately, we know that if we break the rules, if we go against the dynamics, we run the risk of getting excommunicated, getting alienated, getting kicked out where you can no longer hang with the cool kids. And since the brain processes social distress, the same way we process physical harm, we do everything we can to stay connected with our people. It hurts when we're at odds with our people. Right? It breaks our heart when we break up. It's like a punch in the gut when we break with our friends. So we do everything we can to stay in good standings. Not only do we adhere to the rules and dynamics of the network, but we defend them also. And subconsciously, our brains go through this rubric of I am A, we believe this, therefore I. I am A, identifier, we believe this belief, therefore I subscribe to a social norm. I am a Collins, we believe family church come first, therefore on Sunday mornings I'm in the church sanctuary. In every network I'm a part of, there are dynamics that guide my behavior, much like your own networks as well. So you think about this, it's not that saying in philosophy, I think, therefore I am. Well, in this case, it's I am, therefore I do. I am A, we believe this, therefore I take on that behavior. Which makes our networks a far, far, far more powerful tool to accurately describe people, but also speak to the behavior that we're likely to take on. Our interests, our passions, where we go, and what we do. Now, while that's beautiful, and I guess somewhat thought-provoking, Marketers never get there. Instead, marketers rely on an availability heuristic, where they put people in boxes, compartmentalized by information, like your age, your race, your gender, your household income. And their worldview informs how these boxes are created. The construct of these boxes are impaired by their biases. Let me give you an example. Meet my friend, Deborah. Deborah drives a minivan. Does Deborah have kids? Yes. Yeah, right, Deborah's a Does Deborah's kids play a sport? Soccer. Yeah, right. And what sport do they play? Soccer, right, okay, okay. And where does Deborah live? In the Guys, <laughs> we just mapped Deborah's whole entire life based on one data point. You guys are probably good marketers, by the way. But that's what we do as marketers. We put people in a box based on our worldview of what women who drive minivans are supposed to be. Right? It's like saying all women love to shop. It doesn't make any sense. Or all black people do something, fill in the blank with a racist statement. <laughs> <laughs> You're laughing. I don't know what to think about that. <laughs> but it's true. That's how marketers approach describing people. 
There's no wonder then that the work that we create as an industry is so ready. We don't know when it's going to work. We put these titles on people and expect a particular outcome, but these titles don't get at causality as to why we do what we do. Same way we think about millennials. Oh my God, millennials. We have a worldview as markers of millennials. They're narcissistic, they're lazy, they're self-entitled, you know, everything I'm talking about. But it's just not so. Being a millennial speaks to people who were born within a certain time frame, which is a demographic. Which means that not all millennials are the same just because they happen to be between the age of 18 and 36. It just doesn't make sense. We're talking about 80 million in the people in the United States. How are they all the same because they were born in the same year? But that's how marketers see the world. Shame on them. Shame. Shame. <laughs> we have to, as an industry, get beyond the data, get beyond the information, and think about people who they really are based on how they see the world, based on the, the shared beliefs they subscribe to, based on the social norms that they defend and commit to. And if you happen to be incredulous still, let me remind you that Snooki from the Jersey Shore and Beyonce are both millennials, and they ain't the same. <laughs> Trust me. We have to move beyond how we think about people. Because the thing is, no one introduces themselves as, hey, I'm a savvy, digitally connected millennial. No one looks in the mirror and sees and says that. No one self-identifies as such. It says no one identifies themselves as such. There are no shared beliefs. There are no social norms. There are no rituals that guide their behavior, which means it's a fame descriptor. Which means it's not real. Instead, we look in the mirror and say things like, I am a columnist. And there's shared beliefs, social norms, and unwritten rules that guide my behavior. I'm a Michigan Wolverine, go blue. And there's shared beliefs, social norms, and unwritten rules that guide my behavior. I'm Alex's husband, and you better believe there are rules that guide my behavior. <laughs> She's listening. Right? I'm George's father. And there's shared beliefs, social norms, unwritten rules that guide my behavior to be such. I'm a member of Phi Beta Sigma, and there are dynamics that guide my behavior. I'm a Christian, and there's shared beliefs, social norms, unwritten rules that guide my behavior. Some people are sneakerheads, some people are skaters, some people are designers, some people are hockey heads, some people are marathon runners, some people are into cosplay. That's your thing, no, no judgment. <laughs> but within each one of these networks are shared beliefs, social norms, and unwritten rules that guide our behavior. And we use these descriptors, these people, to self-identify. We use them to communicate who we are in this world. And as such, we subscribe to the dynamics that guide the behavior of those people to stay in good standings. And that is super powerful. It's super powerful. Because what it means is that networks provide a far more accurate way to describe people, but also speak to causality as to why we do what we do. And though the data, the facts, provide the facts, they don't accurately capture the nuances of people. They just do a really bad job at it. We're far more than just data. And while we live in this connected world where we, we, we shed reams and reams of data on a daily basis, the data don't accurately describe us. The information doesn't get at the nuances of us. So as marketers, we have to stop confusing information for intimacy. I start thinking about people. But guess what? That doesn't apply to just marketers. It applies to us as individuals. You, you, us. We have to stop looking at each other in boxes. We're more than just man woman. More than just black or white, more than just old and young, and people with shared beliefs, social norms, and other rules that guide the behavior of our people. And if we really want to understand people, we have to commit to being extremely empathetic to understanding how people see the world, because how they see the world informs how they behave in the world. And if we get better at learning each other and understanding each other, we we'll build stronger ties, which will build stronger communities, which will build stronger cities, 
stronger states, and a far greater nation. And that, I think, is an idea worth spreading. Thank you so much.